The first model that we are going to be going over is a bone model. This is a cross section of a bone and there's really only a couple of terms that you guys are going to need to know for this. The first of which is osteocytes. Inside the bone you can see all these little red dots. Those are going to be our osteocytes. <clears throat> In between these osteocytes we have these little grooves inside the bone that is going to be called canaliculi. So I like to think like canaliculi, they're like little canals that connect all of those osteocytes. Next up for this section is going to be a quick little introduction into the neuron. Uh, just kind of a little preface, you guys will be going over the nervous system in great depth later on this semester in Unit 3 in lab. This is just kind of like a little uh, teaser into some of the brief uh, anatomy and histology to a neuron. First thing is just this entire structure in and of itself is called a neuron. That includes the cell body, the axon, the dendrites, the axon terminal, all that good stuff. In the neuron, we're going to start up here on the proximal end. We have the nucleus, that's just this clear ball. We have perikaryon, that is the cytoplasm of the neuron. It's where all these uh, little blue polka dots are. And then just this structure in general is going to be the cell body. So everything including the nucleus, the perikaryon, and this outer part would be the cell body. Next, these little gray projections are going to be our dendrites. That's what receives incoming information from other neurons. We have an axon. Normally the axon would shoot out through here, but we have a little cross section of an axon down here for you guys to look at. And you guys can see a better representation of how this would look in your lab manuals. Just about here, we have this little pink strip that's just before the axon, that is going to be called the axon hillock. So that's just before we reach the axon, it's that little pink strip. Coming down to this end, we're going to have telodendria and synaptic knobs. The way we often test telodendria is with these little orange knobs that are around the cell body. This is meant to represent something that's coming from another neuron. So all these little branches would be coming from other neurons and they would synapse onto the cell body in the hopes of potentially creating action potentials. <clears throat> so telodendria are these little orange bits. Closer to the surface of the cell body, we have synaptic knobs or terminals. This is just meant to represent like the very end of the axon and what is going to be synapsing on a postsynaptic cell. That's another term you guys need to know. Really just any time you see two neurons that are attached, the one that is attached to the other is the presynaptic neuron, and the one that is being attached to is going to be the postsynaptic neuron. So just think like pre and post. Pre is before, post is after. A couple other little quick things. Um, the space that you would find in between, say here, this synaptic terminal and the cell body of this neuron would be the synaptic cleft. So that's going to be tested as a space. That's just the space between the pre and the postsynaptic cell where a neurotransmitter is going to be dumped into where it will be picked up by the postsynaptic cell. <clears throat> Moving on, we have neuroglia that we could test you on. There are several sets of glial cells. We're only asking that you focus on a couple uh, specific ones for lab thus far. Neuroglia is just the broad definition like, oh, we have multiple glial cells and they can be found anywhere. A couple examples you can see are right here. On this axon, we have this little pink bubble and then another one down here. This is going to be an example of a glial cell. We do not have a way of distinguishing in the lab setting whether something is going to be CNS or PNS just based off of these models. So how your TA is often going to ask it is, Name this glial cell if it were in the CNS. And the answer that, to that would be an oligodendrocyte. <clears throat> the other one that you guys are going to need to know is a Schwann cell, which is a glial cell that you would find in the PNS, the peripheral nervous system. These two glial cells are responsible for myelinating axons amongst other things. 
So that's how we're gonna likely test you guys this, is just point to this and say, name this glial cell as if it were in the PNS. That would be a Schwann cell. Three other terms you might not have in your lab notebook but need to be added are myelin, internode, and node of Ranvier. Myelin is just the protein that goes around these axons. It uh, speeds up the rate of action potentials. An internode is going to be all this segment of the axon that is myelinated. And then the node of Ranvier is going to be the piece that is unmyelinated. So you can see a really good example here on this end. It's just this little gray sheath that's uncovered by myelin. And then the same could be said for over here. This would be a node of Ranvier. You guys would learn in class eventually that action potentials jump from node to node. And that's called saltatory propagation. <clears throat> But for now, just know that an internode is a myelinated portion of an axon and a node of Ranvier is going to be an unmyelinated portion of your axon. All right, guys, now we're going to start by going over the integumentary system portion that you are going to need to know on the model for your lab. <clears throat> just a couple quick notes. Um, really pay attention to when I say things like layers, structures versus regions versus definitions, those are going to come into play a lot in the next little bit. So make sure you're really paying attention to when I say those key terms because that is going to be how you will be tested on your quiz and practical. We're going to start off with the layers of the skin. Starting at the top, we have the stratum corneum. Just a quick note, it looks like there is a separation between these two layers right here. There's like a little step down as though they were stairs. Both of these are considered the first layer of the skin, which would be the stratum corneum. The next layer is going to be the stratum lucidum. Next, the stratum granulosum. The stratum spinosum, that's this light blue layer right here. The stratum germinativum or stratum basale. And then this next one is going to be the basal lamina. So make sure you guys know all those layers. We have a couple mnemonics in lab that we teach you. Uh, the biggest one is cut lab, grab some German beer, and that often really helps students out. Um, just an important note though, the basal lamina is not going to be an epidermal layer. That is going to be part of the dermis. Moving on, we're going to start getting into some of the structures that are in here. A couple quick ones that we just need to go over with you guys real quick. Arteries and veins. You see an example of an artery right here. It's this red structure. And a vein right here. It's this blue structure. Another important term is a nerve. You do have nerves in your skin, thankfully, which is these yellow structures kind of going all over the place. Next is going to be our papillary plexus. A plexus in the context of the skin is just going to be any cluster of uh, fibers such as arteries, veins, nerves, all that stuff. So papillary plexus, where we're going to find that is a cluster of those fibers near the papillary layer of the dermis. So all that cluster of stuff right there, that would be a papillary plexus. We're going to go over a couple of the corpuscles real quick, starting with tactile corpuscles. Right here you can see an example of a tactile corpuscle. It looks like a tomato, so I often tell my students, uh, just remember, tactile tomato. <clears throat> Coming over here, we have an example of a lamellated corpuscle. It looks like a watermelon. Uh, I don't know if this helps my students, but I usually tell them I remember this because it's a watermelamellated corpuscle, and then that usually makes them giggle. I don't know if that helps you guys. But that is going to be a lamellated corpuscle. And then our last one is going to be these pink squash looking structures over here. This is going to be an example of a Ruffini corpuscle. All those are responsible for our perception of touch, distension, compression, shock, all that good stuff. Next, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the sweat glands and the two types that we have. First of which is going to be our marocrine sweat gland, that's going to be this white one right here, and then our apocrine sweat gland, that's going to be this green one. <clears throat> apocrine sweat glands, I usually like to tell my students, just think like a green apple, apple, apocrine, and that usually helps them out. Apocrine sweat glands are the ones that don't come active or become active until puberty, so those are the ones that make uh, the smell of like body odor eventually once you hit puberty. 
And then coming up here at the top, we can see a pore of our sweat gland. So this is just the opening onto the surface of the skin where you would see sweat come through. And you can see another example over here. <clears throat> Last of the glands that we're going to talk about real quick is going to be our sebaceous glands. Those are the glands responsible for producing oil that lubricates our hair. That's going to be these purple ones right here that are a little further up off the hair root, kind of closer to the skin surface. All right, next we're going to get into talking a lot about the hair specifically. We have a root hair plexus. That's going to be the cluster of fibers, like this artery and vein, that's going into the root of the hair. We have erector pili muscles. It's these pink strips right here. These are the muscles responsible for giving you your goosebumps. <clears throat> Next two terms, hair root and hair shaft, are going to be tested as regions. So make sure you have that written down. Hair root and hair shaft are going to be regions. I usually tell my students, looking at this specific hair, everything below the sebaceous gland, this region is going to be the hair root. And everything above the sebaceous gland, the visible part of the hair that you can see, is going to be our hair shaft. Next, <clears throat> hair follicle. That is going to be the organ responsible for hair production. We often test that as definition only. So just remember a hair follicle is responsible for the production of your hair. Next is going to be our hair bulb and our hair papilla. These are kind of a little confusing, so pay close attention. Here you can see there's this part of the hair that kind of comes to a circular, kind of almost bulbous shape. That's going to be the hair bulb, and that is a structure. This indent in the hair root itself, remember that's a region, the hair root, this indent is going to be the hair papilla. It's where that uh, root hair plexus lies, but just know that that's different between asking about this plexus, this vasculature, versus this indent in the hair root itself, which would be the hair papilla. Next is going to be a bunch of layers we're going to talk about. We're going to skip to cuticle real quick because we test cuticle in a very specific way. We will point to these exposed hairs on the top of the skin and say name this layer and that's going to be the cuticle. We will only test you on cuticle on this because that's the clear layer that's just going to surround that hair shaft. <clears throat> the rest of them going from medulla to connective tissue sheath, I'm going to save you a little bit of time. We're going to start at medulla, we're going to skip cuticle obviously and we're going to work our way down. Next to medulla, right, innermost white layer. Next to cortex, right, dark brown. Next to internal root sheath, right, light brown. Next to external root sheath, right, yellow. Next to glassy membrane, right, blue. And next to connective tissue sheath, right, purple. So obviously trying to show you guys this on this model right now is going to be really difficult, but if these, if you have those colors, when you come into lab, you'll be able to look at this closely and you'll be able to distinguish it almost instantly. Going from connective tissue sheath to glassy membrane to external root sheath, internal root sheath to cortex, and then eventually the medulla. So that's going to be the end of your videos for lab one. Make sure you look at this and all the other supplementary information that you have before coming to class. So that way you can just ask your TA, DA a couple questions, maybe work with your lab mates on some of these models. And yeah, good luck on your quizzes and stuff, guys. And I'll catch you next week.